Aloha, good afternoon. I'm Ralph Winnie, Vice President of the Eurasia Center and its Eurasian Business Coalition. We are fortunate today to have Art Harmon, the Executive Director of the Conservative Caucus, who has just recently returned to the United States from a very productive trip to Taiwan. And uh, Mr. Harmon is going to discuss with us his observations from a cultural, social, economic, and political standpoint of his uh, trip uh, to Taiwan and what it means for engagement um, with between uh, mainland China and the United States vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. So, uh, Art, could you talk about uh, what it was like when you first arrived in Taiwan um, and sort of the backdrop of your, your trip and what you were hoping to accomplish? Sure, and thanks so much, Ralph. Uh, glad to be on with you. Uh, you know, I, I went to Taiwan for two reasons. Uh, uh, one was explore the island, bit of a vacation, but then also strategically minded, you know, what can I impart to Taiwan officials? What can I learn from them? What do they need from America to better uh, deter China from an, at an attack? Uh, so, uh, you know, I, abs I, I was in Taiwan uh, in 2014, that was with uh, Congressman Stockman. I was his legislative director. And uh, between the two of us, we managed to do things that helped Taiwan at the time. And, uh, what, and what kind of things? Uh, working for selling uh, Taiwan uh, technology to build their indigenous submarines, uh, upgrades for F-16 fighters and sales of new fighters. Uh, uh, we were trying to get them observer status in the RIMPAC uh, naval exercises. At that time, under Obama, uh, Obama was having Thai, uh, China, communist China, participate in the RIMPAC exercises, giving them the advantage of watching our, uh, our naval tactics, which is just absolutely unbelievable. Um, and we're kind of paying the price for that now. Uh, Do you know how that impacted Hawaii at the time? Or was there any engagement with the Hawaii delegation when you went to Taiwan back then? Or what um, perspective was from uh, people in Hawaii? Were you able well, to gauge at I, that time? At that time, no, I, I don't know at all. That, that didn't come up. We were meeting with vice president and defense ministers, things sure. like that. Uh, um and talking on on the more national levels um but you know hawaii is the third island chain this this is uh uh china's aim is to drive the us back to the shores of hawaii and then uh if they were to get their way with propaganda and so forth they would probably try to get hawaii to uh, secede from the u.s become independent and then become essentially a vassal of china this is what they do this is what they're doing around the world uh, and then they ensnare them in debt and they can control them like puppets so uh, hawaii is definitely on china's radar uh, but not in a good way when you were in Taiwan, what kind of perspective were you able to gauge from your daily interactions with the, the people in terms of their business connection with China and or their engagement uh, with the United States? What would they like to see more from the U.S. or, or what would they like to see uh, from China in terms of their engagement? Because there's over a million Taiwanese doing some form of business in mainland China. So that creates a very unique economic and strategic relationship between Taiwan and mainland China. Yet Taiwan is very closely tied and aligned politically with the United States. Well, uh, this is a sort of, a, in a way, a complicating uh, uh, affair, and it's also a perhaps slightly deterrent uh, um uh way because uh if 
China goes to war, then there's a lot of business contacts that'll be destroyed, a lot of uh, um, uh, customers abroad that'll be uh, lost and so forth, not to mention things like the semiconductor industry, which uh, would be the, um, the grand prize of China seizing Taiwan. If they seize those plants intact, then they rule, uh, you know, ninety-three percent of the uh, semiconductor market. They can put in back doors. They can also use it to as blackmail. That if you want ships, you're going to get out of the uh, Western Pacific. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. You're going to start using uh, their uh, China, the the reserve currency that China is is starting to build along with the BRICS. And is that um, what the Taiwanese people believe? The people that well, you know, there, to there, is, the there is a, amongst civilians, uh, regular citizens. I had lots of talks. Uh, everything from just people that I got in chatting with, Uber drivers, everything. And there's sort of a dividing line between those that see China as a serious threat and those that dismiss it. Uh, and and I found that also with uh, with officials, with some who believe that war is not inevitable and that it can be deterred, and some that that believe it won't happen for years. Um, What's the basis for that rationale? Is it the economic and strategic alliances that exist? The fact that it's uh, that everyone there is Chinese. Or, or um, what is their rationale for thinking there's going to be? Well, more? not everyone's Chinese because Taiwanese yeah. have yeah. their own identity and more and more, uh, you know, except for the older uh, citizens who still remember, uh, you know, the uh, the early uh, Taiwan government, the Kuomintang and, and uh, sure. uh, Kai-shek, they... Uh, um, Taiwanese today feel themselves as Taiwanese, that, that they don't consider themselves Chinese. Um, and so China knows that they're losing uh, Taiwan, that, that getting a, uh, a Hong Kong-like agreement is now impossible, particularly since China, you know, uh, abrogated that international agreement. And... Um, and that's the West perception that they abrogated that agreement. And so when no, people no, look no, at that, not not just the West perception, yeah. it's it's the reality because they they're you know now cracking down. Uh, you 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 can't uh, talk about things you used to be able to talk about. Right. They they shipped a lot of uh, uh, demonstrators and human rights activists to God knows where, probably concentration camps in the area of the Uyghurs and. And so forth. So it's becoming China, and uh, and they will kill the uh, goose that laid the the golden egg yeah. um, over time. And that's what these people feel. Uh, the younger generation in Taiwan feels that any kind of rapprochement with China could lead to that sort of situation. Is that what you're finding when you're oh, down oh, there? Oh yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, and and you know the majority party, the uh, Democrat uh, Progressive Party, is uh, um, you know they people in that understand that that this would be a uh, a deal with the devil, and uh, after maybe a couple of years of pretending to be nice, then um, then it then it would be all over. You know, the concentration camps. They're, uh, and re-education, it would be very difficult for them to crush the independent spirit in Taiwan. It would have to be done with brutal force. Uh, and uh, and, and I, But I don't think too many really look at that uh, and think that they can fight a war and win a war. Um, if China starts a war, they're going to finish the war one way or another. And it won't be pretty. And how confident are you in the younger millennial generation, whether it's in Taiwan or in mainland China, that is Western trained and educated? They have only known economic peace and prosperity. 
Uh, and if you ask them what they want in life, they want to be entrepreneurs. They want to trade and they want to invest. Um, and the, apparently the uh, government, the People's Republic, has been able to co-opt many of them into the system by offering them a business development network where they can actually make money and spend their money. Now, we saw a crack during the COVID period because many of these young people were locked down and they could not uh, engage in any kind of commerce. They couldn't leave their homes. They couldn't travel. And then they watched the World Cup of Soccer and they realize all the state, they see the stadiums filled and they don't understand why their government is cracking down on them. So they go out in the streets and protest. And then the government backs off and they relax these restrictions. Are you confident that something like that could happen in, in, in both China and uh, Taiwan if the governments become very oppressive and or try and force a regime down the other side's back, per se? rather than allowing trade and commerce to, to flourish and develop? Well, there's tons of commerce now, uh, oh. and that uh, that shows no sign of lessening. Um, okay. But if there's a war, then all bets are off. And, and there's only, a, you know, uh, a few options. One is uh, China just keeps bullying uh, Taiwan, hoping for, um, you know, to... To, to get some sort of accommodation, but I don't think that'll happen. Um, the uh, or they 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 do a war and they take it over. Uh, they'll take over a uh, you know a broken nest, as uh, from the article of of, of, of one researcher, uh, b because a lot of infrastructure will be destroyed. It's even possible that Taiwanese would uh, destroy their semiconductor plants on the way out, so to speak, to prevent them from uh, falling in enemy hands. Uh, and we would actually be better off if, if they didn't do that. And if China took the island, we would be better off bombing those uh, plants to smithereens to prevent that blackmail that would happen, to prevent uh, back doors being put in electronics including those that uh, are used in our military. Uh, so uh, there, there just aren't very many choices. Uh, they, China knows that an accommodation a la Hong Kong really will never happen. Now, if they keep up the bullying, encircling the island, firing missiles over, threatening war, over five or 10 years, could the population become weary of that and want something uh, like that? I don't know. You know, the, the Hong Kong kind of spoiled that for uh, Xi Jinping um, be, because people, even those that kind of think you know, some sort of accommodation would be nice, <laughs> they, they know what, it, what happens uh, when they go the, the Hong Kong route. And within China, as we know, the growth has, has slowed and there's sort of a real estate bubble and there's unemployment, especially among younger people. So that may, um, that may force some sort of change in the leadership, perhaps, with, within China um, down the line. Do you see that, any, that may be impacting some sort of engagement with Taiwan? Well, I don't see uh, Xi Jinping relinquishing power or being overthrown. He has done everything he can to consolidate power in in a similar vein as uh, as Putin has. Uh, you know, anyone with uh, opposing ideas gets purged. We saw was it Hu Jintao in the uh, last party congress in in October. Um, he was literally carried away in a very staged thing. He was reportedly going to say, uh, yeah, I'm with you on uh, COVID. I'm with you on censorship and stuff like that, but don't invade Taiwan. And they literally picked the guy up and and, and hauled him out. Um, again, it was state. Uh, he probably knew it was coming, but, but he probably is sort of like, 
you know, somebody knowingly who has no choice but to walk into uh, uh, their death. And uh, I have no idea what, what happened to him. So I'm not expecting uh, anything, any regime change, except that, and, and this is where you, you pointed out something, you know, th their economy is gradually, slowly Im imploding. Uh, the people are restless to a degree. The only thing that keeps them from a revolution, I think, another Tiananmen Square, is this one thing, and that's the Great Firewall uh, that prevents communication. Uh, but they have a good sense of what happens outside of China and what the world is like. Uh, so, and so here's the thing: what group of people are most likely to stage a revolution? So as the economy uh, in China deteriorates, you have more and more unemployed. They won't be able to afford to keep building ghost, ghost cities and other make work projects. And, uh, and so you'll, unemployment will increase. Now, if they invade Taiwan, then it gets 10 times worse, maybe 100 times worse, because right. you may have two, 300 million unemployed people. And guess what? There's uh, like, I don't know, 90 million uh, Communist Party members, and most of those aren't hardcore. It's like you join right. the party to advance in uh, your career. Right, uh, especially yeah. on the economic side to make money. Yeah, e exactly. So, uh, so, but this is not necessarily too much of a deterrence because throughout history, you know, in World War II is a good example. You 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 had two uh, thug dictators, Hitler and uh, and uh, and uh, Tojo and so forth in Japan. They both had strong economies. They had good high tech. They could have ruled the uh, the world and even supplanted the U.S. as the leader in the technology and so forth. But they chose war and they paid the price. Uh, and both were absolutely ruined after World War II. Uh, they built back and, and now they're uh, you know, very uh, peace-minded. But this is what could face Xi Jinping. Um, and it's in the US's interest to talk about democracy, to talk about uh, human rights and the innate human rights everybody in China has. Uh, so that, because that is how you can increase dissatisfaction with Xi Jinping, undermining his rule in a way that could um, force him to retrench from his goals of worldwide conquest, and even in one of the uh, the areas that I deal with, space, trying to uh, rule space as well. And I think some of the first human rights lawyers that have come out of China have really focused on um, environmental issues, um, bad air, bad water, as a way to sort of challenge the competency of various um, party officials. And after Tiananmen Square, we saw that the Chinese were, they weren't allowed to challenge the legitimacy of the CCP but they could challenge the competency. Um, if there was a graft and corruption or if there were issues involving environmental degradation. Um, and that's where you saw some of the pushback because it also impacted their ability to engage in international commerce and um, how it impacted them, you know, uh, from a, from a um, PR standpoint. Um, if there's graft and corruption, people aren't going to want to come and invest in your country. Do you see any issues with corruption as far as from the Taiwanese side, in terms of their engagement with the Chinese? How how do they see um, the 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 Chinese um, people in terms of um, their ability to interact with them? Well, I think they know, you, you know, Taiwan is a remarkably vibrant democracy. It is remarkably uncorrupt. It is, uh, it is free enterprise is so 
it's it's better than than here in the U.S. I was talking to uh, uh, an, an official with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and I said, you know, there's so much street commerce, small industry. Uh, you 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 walk along the uh, the night markets, the arcades, and so forth, and it's just teeny small businesses. Oh, they're not necessarily wealthy. Uh, but you'll find the kids working there sure. and everything, whether they're fixing scooters or selling food or or house housewares. Um, and so, you know, it is the antithesis of the Chinese way of doing business, which is you've got to grease the palms. You 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 are um, you you've got to grease the palms of folks like uh, Kissinger if you want to do big business there. Uh, that's how he makes his money uh, off of uh, Xi Jinping's uh, uh, back pocket. So uh, I think, it, you know, big companies that do do business there, um, you know, like, uh, um, you know, some of the Apple with Foxconn. Well, they they they've paid uh, undoubtedly handsomely to get access to to uh, uh, do their factories there and so forth, uh, they either turn their uh, blind eye or whatever to the labor practices because you know the child labor is common, slave labor is, is the, the watch word. You go to work in one of those factories and you're probably not just commuting from home like we do, you're probably living in, in a dormitorium and you're allowed out for X hours a day and maybe you'll get Sunday off, that sort of thing. So it's a very different paradigm. And uh, uh, so those China, those Taiwanese that think about it, well, if, if you're doing business, you just do business, just like the Americans, and you close your eyes and you pretend not to see and hear the screams of the slave labor. Uh, and this is what you know destroyed U.S. manufacturing. They all went there. They exported uh, their. Pollution. How do we? How does the United States stay engaged with China on a proactive level um, to keep, say, Russia, Iran um, from gaining a stronger foothold? So we're so the U.S. is managing the relationship at a much higher level, and we're keeping uh, our enemies away from engaging with the Chinese to create well, see, a stronger is, alliance against us. Yeah, th that th this sense? is what, oh, it, oh, it, it makes absolute sense, but um, it is the opposite of what's happening. Instead, this administration, Biden administration, has been pulling together um, uh, China, uh, you know, Russia, China, Iran, and others into a, a naval axis working against us. Now, here, here's where it started and where it could have turned out differently. 2015, uh, President, or then Donald Trump comes down the escalator, and immediately the attacks on him were very specific. It was, you're a Russian agent. And of course, he wasn't. He was the opposite. Um, but by doing that and accusing him of that and all these planted things, uh, you, you know, you know the you know, projection. Uh, you know the the criminal accuses others of doing what they're doing themselves. So uh, they were the ones coll colluding with the Democrats, with uh, with Russia, with um, uh, China, and and everyone else to create fake crimes against Trump. But if they had not done that, I think it is very possible that. Trump could have had the um, the ability to sit down with Putin without all of that rancor that, that was artificially created by the Democrat Party, the media, the FBI, and others. Uh, and he could have said, look, we are more alike than we are different. Yeah, you're a rep you've got a repressive government, but we both... Uh, do not want China to rule the earth. Let's work together. We can have our differences on all sorts of things. After all, we work together on the space station. Uh, so, but if if we, uh, you know, if the two of us work and and try to, uh, you know, slow the rise of China, now that could have turned out very differently. The world today would be very different 
So an opposite uh, approach from what Kissinger did. Well, of course. Instead I mean, of going to the yeah, Russians yeah. instead of the Chinese. Yeah. Okay. Y yes. Yeah. Uh, that that was the intent. It was a failed intent, but it, it was the intent of rapprochement with with China. Unfortunately, we built them up into a uh, tyranny that's now more powerful militarily than us and has designs on us. But uh, uh, yeah, we, we had the opportunity in 2015. President Trump could have done that, but he was it became politically impossible by all the screams of you're a Russian agent. Uh, and so I would place at the footsteps of the Democrat National Committee uh, responsibility for everything that, that's happened in the world um, uh, up till now. That, that's so bad. Hawaii, as the center of uh, the Asia Pacific region, I mean, we have Pearl Harbor. Our military installations are here. So we, you, you indicated that Hawaii sort of poses somewhat of a um, a strategic importance for China as a oh, way. Yeah. It is. You, you know, it, it back before uh, the the terrible, um, you know, uh, deal to let uh, Taiwan, uh, uh, China into the UN, uh, and they actually would have had leverage to say, uh, Taiwan becomes independent if you want this. Uh, Bush could have had the leverage, uh, was Bush one, uh, WTO and, and, and so forth to say, you, you want the American market? Okay, fine. You get the American market, but you give up, uh, Taiwan. They're, they will be an independent country and you will recognize them. And we will continue to uh, to arm and support them. Uh, when China was starting their their economic reforms, that's when this should have happened, in your view. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a okay. price. You want to participate? You you let's def defuse this potential um, you know conflict point in the future. Just end it, um, and it would actually be uh, quite healthy for China even today to do that. But Xi Jinping's imperial ambitions are uh, are trumping that so to speak because uh, he wants that conquest to take if only to take people's minds off of um, <laughs> off of the bad economy that yeah. that is uh, the typical thing you know why yeah. did uh, um, uh, uh, what, what, why was the Falklands war uh, well yeah. because Argentina was having a crappy economy. I mean, it's interesting when you're t when you have Chinese delegations that come to Hawaii on vacation, they want to go to Pearl Harbor because um, they want to, in their views, pay respects to the American servicemen that were killed by the Japanese. Um, as you know, the Japanese Imperial Army um, was very ruthless in their conquest of China. Um, and I say the Japanese Imperial Army, I'm not referring at all to Japanese citizens or Japanese Americans. We're talking about the Japanese military that was in control under Tojo, who you earlier referenced. So the Chinese have very long memories, and they remember that the U.S. helped them in the fight against the Japanese. Do you see any of that goodwill keeping the, the government from making any sort of incursions into the Asia Pacific region that would be harmful to both Hawaii and or the United and the mainland United States. You mean China? Yeah. Uh, no, no. I mean China. Uh, uh, because there is still a reservoir of goodwill because we helped them fight the Japanese and kept their country from being split up by foreign dominating powers. Yeah. No. It's the exact opposite. You know. Uh, um, yeah. When I when I was working in Congress, we um, yeah we we would get two papers that 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 I asked for to be put on my yeah. desk first. One was uh, Epoch Times because they 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 yeah. are very uh, truthful on China, and the other is China Daily, which is a Communist Party um, you know propaganda piece. And I would humorously say that you could uh, pick up the front section of that and just flip through the pages. And you would always find something attacking uh, Japanese, often in very sort of jingoistic, uh, crude ways. The um, 
in order to justify their repression and so forth in China, they have to create enemies. And while the U.S. Uh, and Germany, we get along, and Japan, we, we get along so many years later, uh, right. it's, it's been the perceived but the false um, uh, best interest of the, the communist regime to keep Japan as an enemy. So they portray the, Ch the Japanese in ways that we would find absolutely revolting whether in pop culture or in uh, in news they they and you know it 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 is the same sort of language as you know racists would use uh, uh, elsewhere so um they're fanning that flame so they're the government of china for the purpose of keeping uh you know the the chinese people thinking they have an enemy there no, they, they, they got a friend and a trading partner, but it suits the communist dictatorship to uh, to uh, educate them from birth that China, uh, that, that Japan is evil, Korea is evil, um, and uh, and the Americans. And the, uh, very similar to how uh, in North Korea, uh, they that they, they they do the same things, uh, you know, it, it's very similar. Okay, I think we um, have finished our uh, discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Always Harmon. happy to be on with you. And, uh, you know, another time we might discuss uh, other aspects of, uh, you know, Taiwan and, and their, their, their view towards the world and the US. Thank you so much. You're very welcome.